Well, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming this evening on behalf of the Barnes County Historical Museum along with the Dakota Resource Council. Uh, we are very pleased this morning, this morning, this evening, to have uh, Dr. John Eicher. He is a professor emeritus of agricultural economics. He has retired from the university at Missouri in 2000. I know he's been very busy in the last 24 years, and he's going to come and talk to us uh, about 50 years that changed everything, farming, food, and community. So would you lend a hand and let us welcome our guest speaker. <laughs> So, so I, I talk, like to talk about my truth as being my perspective, and if your truth is different than mine, which it may be because you have lived a different life I have and you have different perspectives than I do, that's all right with me. I think what it is is we, we each ought to be willing to kind of speak our perspectives and, and our truth openly, and if we share it with each other and respect each other's opinion and perspective, then I think together we're going to get closer to the truth. So that's kind of where I'm coming from tonight. So if you want to understand my truth, then you need to understand a little bit about my story to begin with. So I'd say that my story, I began, I, I started off on the, I was actually, what are we doing now? Okay. Okay. How about this? Is that all right? Okay. We'll go on from here. When I was growing up early, I was born in, in 1939. So I grew up in the 40s and 50s, and I was on a small dairy farm down in southwest Missouri. And the farms around us were small family farms like ours, and they were diversified farms. And everybody basically had a few cows and a few pigs and a few uh, cattle and a few chickens around that we killed for the fall and the hogs. We'd butcher some and we'd sell the rest to make the farm payments and things like that. But that was pretty typical of the farming operation. When I was growing up, we basically had a local food system. What we didn't grow on our own farms was processed probably within a 50 mile radius of about anything there. We had local packing companies, we had local canneries, we had local flour mills within the towns around us. We had a small grocery store. There weren't any supermarkets back in those days. There were grocery stores, no self checkout. You go in and give your bill. The grocery list to the guy behind the counter or the girl behind the counter, and they fill it out, bring it back, put it in a brown coat, and total it up, and say, I put it on the ticket, put it on the bill, and that's the way you got your groceries. It wasn't any fast food restaurants. We had vibrant communities back then because we were farming communities. You couldn't farm by yourself in those days because we were farming by horses or even by tractors in at, at threshing time and time to fill silos and Time to put up hay and things like that. You couldn't do it all yourself. So the neighbors would all get together and go from farm to farm. And when I was growing up, what we saw was industrial agriculture basically is when they turned out grade school, when the steam engine come by, going from one farm to the other to pull the threshing machine. And the people behind them with horses and so on going from the farm to farm. There weren't any tractors. And we had vibrant rural communities because people worked together and they sent their kids to the same schools. They went to the churches together and everybody knew each other and helped each other out. And the women all worked together to feed the silo crews and the threshing crews to get together for dinner and they got together and quilted quilts for the winter time and comforters and things of that nature. We had strong rural communities. And I had an opportunity back then to go from the small high school to the University of Missouri when they didn't have a tuition, $67.50 a semester you could go to school. I went through, got my undergraduate degree. I graduated. I wanted to go out and see the world and make some money. I went to work for Wilson Packing Company, the third largest beef packing company in the country at that particular time. I worked with them for three years and I decided that wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. I come back to graduate school and got my PhD agricultural economics in 1970. And then I started off on a 30-year academic career as an agricultural economist. I went to four different universities, North Carolina State, Oklahoma State, University of Georgia, University of Missouri. And I was 
I was, I was first half of that academic career. I was a very traditional agricultural economist. It's one of those guys that says farm has to be a business, not a way of life. Don't let the family get in the way of the farm business. You got to farm for the economic bottom line. So that's what I was taught, and that's what I was teaching farmers. During the fine farm financial crisis of the 1980s that I'll talk about a lot more later on, I had to rethink all of what I had been taught as an agricultural economist. I had to think it all over again. The second half of my academic career, I would talk about and, and tried to teach and understand the whole idea of what I now call sustainable agriculture. Kind of a balanced approach to agriculture. Agriculture as a way of life as well as a way to make a living and a way to be a responsible member of a rural community a stock principal steward of the soil. I've been retired now for 25 or 24 years. And ever since I retired, I continue to work on those issues of sustainability and family farms and viable rural communities. I still believe that we have an opportunity to recreate much of good of what we have lost. So if we set the stage then for the 1970s, when we talk about the 50 years of change we go through, I think an important thing, one of the most important things are the technologies that came out of World War II. You're familiar with those, they're common now, but they were the mechanical technologies that led to affordable farm tractors. We only got a farm tractor after World War II because when they took the factories that had produced in tanks and jeeps and started producing tractors that were much more affordable, and so farmers, ordinary farmers could afford to buy a tractor. The cheap nitrogen fertilizer, and they talk about it being cheap, but it was affordable for farmers after that because of the mission factories that made the, made the dynamite and the mission for the bombs, they transferred that over to making nitrogen fertilizer. The synthetic pesticides come out of the research they did for nerve gas in World War II. But the second important thing that, that these te new technologies made the change possible in agriculture, but the change in farm policies is what made that change inevitable. They pulled together a committee in, in, in Washington. I, I'm not sure that it was in Washington, but there was an organization called the Committee for Economic Development. It was a big, a big global committee that was made up of the presidents of the major corporations across the country, not just in agriculture, but all across the country, the big corporations, presidents of universities and high government government officials. The, the Council of Economic Development, the Committee of Economic Development claims credit for the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and, and the exchange of the international currencies, things like that. They put together a committee to study the problem of agriculture, as they call it. And, and to that committee, the problem of agriculture, it wasn't making efficient use of the land and the people in rural areas. And the committee can, came up with an adaptive approach to agriculture. This is the head. In this committee, it was the head of the agribusiness corporations and the agricultural economists and the agricultural policy people. And this was one of the conclusions they come up with. I hope you can read it. It says, the movement of people out of agriculture because of the increasing technologies that allow them to have bigger farms. They said, we've been moving people out of agriculture and the farms are getting bigger. But they said the movement of people out of agriculture has not been fast enough to take full advantage of the opportunities that are improving farm technologies that I've talked about and the increasing capital, the use of capital, be able to use more capital on the larger farming operations and have not been to make full use of that. So that the CED proposed then what they called an adaptive approach. They said we need to utilize positive government actions to facilitate and promote the movement of labor and capital to where it will be more productive, meaning out of agriculture, and into industry, into the factories and various other places. They set a specific goal. They said, we need to move one third of the farmers off their farms in the next five years. That was a conscience strategy. And the USDA adopted that strategy. Proposals were basically implemented in USDA programs. They had a follow-up study 10 years later and that, that committee concluded they followed everything we told them to do and we got the results that we expected to get. <laughs> Those strategy changes brought about that had uh, changes were implemented by USDA. It was less control of production. Up to then, government programs had kind of 
held up prices to what they established as parity prices back in the original farm bill. They kind of held it up to that level by limiting the amount of production so the market prices would be higher. They said we've got to have less production control so we can allow the market to increase production and allow the prices to go lower. And that way we'll force out the least efficient farmers. And so we'll lower the commodity price support levels and allow the prices to go down as we increase the production. And we'll move toward a free market economy because they knew in a free market economy with the new technologies and the capital and the smaller farmers couldn't compete and they would be squeezed out. The result would be fewer farmers and there would be larger farms and we'd capture the economies of scale of what I now call industrial agriculture, specialized standardize, consolidate into larger and larger farming operations, you can mechanize and routinize and increase the economic efficiency of agriculture. So they reduced the number of farms. They reduced the number of families. And they recognized that the fact when those families left the communities, each job, that farm job, created or supported three non-farm jobs within the community. So it wasn't just the family farmers that were leaving, for every job that was lost on the farm, there were three jobs is what they estimated. It varies by where you are from three up to four or five, six, you hear different things, that's the multiplier. But it wasn't just the farmers they were forcing off of the farms, it was destroying jobs for people in rural communities. And rural communities suffered, farm population declined by over 50% between 1950 and 1970. A big part of that was the part of it was the change in technology before the change in policy, but a big part of that was the conscious change in farm policy to move farmers out of agriculture into where they would be more productive so we could make more efficient use of the land. So let me talk about then that leads up to the 1970s, beginning of the, the 70 or the 50 years. I call it a decade of turbulence, is what we got into then. The rural communities during the 1970s continued to, after I talked about going up to the 70s, they continued to suffer as the farm population dropped and they lost another 14% of their population between 1970 and 1976. Then in the early 70s, then as farmers increased their production, they reduced the price and, and reduced or the production controls, then they increased the production. And then we had surplus grain and we had depressed prices and and that was when we come into the era then as they continued the policies into the mix and butts era of, of agricultural policies. And so they said, okay, what we got to do, we got surplus production. We're not going to go back to controlling production here. We're going to open up the global markets that are going to feed the world. So they had the Russian grain deal then that came along in 1975, which some of you may well remember. And that was when Earl Butts became famous for the one that was saying, okay, we're going to feed the world, produce, you know, fence row to fence row, take out the fence rows, get big or get out. That whole system that started in the 60s was really amplified in the 1970s. And we had strong export markets. And they were loaning a lot of money to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, loaning a lot of money to developing countries. They were buying grain from there. And we had rising grain prices going into the, into the late 1970s. That was about the time whenever I come out of school and went into the 70s. And that was the years of prosperity, really, for farmers in the late 1970s. And I remember going to North Carolina State University and I was working with a grain marketing specialist down there. And there's a group of farmers I'd never heard of this before. They were going on a big cruise. And they had invited my colleague to go along with him. He was going to teach you know, take his wife along and go on a week cruise, and all he had to do was do a little teaching while I was there, but his years across the area rising again. So we had record high grain prices. As a result of that, we had farmland prices that were going up during that period of time. But we had something else that was going on that was driving farmland prices up, but also was driving other prices. We had the OPEC oil embargo in 1973, and then the Iranian Revolution in 79. We've gotten into high inflation rates because we had high energy costs, high inflation rates. So the cost of farm inputs were going up right along with it. And when I got that time, I'd moved to Oklahoma State University. And the big thing out there was the cost price squeeze. Oh, yeah, we had record high uh, commodity prices for wheat and corn and so on and other things. But we also had record high fertilizer prices, record high fuel prices, and so on. And so farmers were caught in the cost of the price squeeze, the cash flow squeeze. We 
so-called experts, economists, are saying, well, just borrow against your inflated land prices. I mean, land prices are high. Just let them borrow money to meet your cash flow that way. It made a lot of economic sense. That's the way the big industry works. And so, so that's what a lot of them did. So I want to take a little bit of trench and go back and say, okay, this is the things that were happening in the livestock market. I talked about the grain. So the big things going on in the livestock market in the 1970s. That's when the fast food come along. I saw the first fast food restaurant I saw when I went to the college, University of Missouri uh, in, in the early 60s. But by the 70s come along, then it was kind of the fast food nation. You know, we talked about the Hamburger Society. I was in Oklahoma at that time. And I'd go to the cattle feeders seminar and they'd say, well, cattle feeders are never going to lose money again. <laughs> We can beat cattle forever because everybody wants to eat beef. Everybody wants hamburgers. We got McDonald's and Hardee's and everybody coming along. And then we had KFC coming along. We had chicken coming in and Pizza Hut. I mean, you know, we're going crazy in the food. The cattle feeders began to move off of the farm feedlots and moved into the big feedlots out on the high plains out in, out, out in Texas, out in western Oklahoma and places like that. We were trying to ramp up beef production to meet this growing demand for beef. Beef prices got so high, and next in place, the price uh, freeze on retail beef prices. They go much higher. Cattle herd producers held off. They thought, well, after the freeze is off, then you got the prices to go way up. But instead of that, freeze was off. They held their cattle back. They started marketing all the cattle, and the prices came down. And then while beef prices were high, the chicken producers were producing all out. They had already gone in factory years earlier. So they started producing chickens, KFC and all of that. And pretty soon, beef wasn't so strong anymore because we had cheap chicken and then pork lost out the increased demand for beef and lower prices for chicken. And so we had a situation, you know, where it was really um, a very turbulent time in the livestock business. So that was a livestock marketing system where people didn't know what was going on during that time. But the prices began to come back in the late 70s with the inflation and economy going and so on, inflation and so on. But during this period of time, livestock producers as well as crop producers, they sort of followed the advice that we so-called experts, those that got big rather than get out, and they borrowed money to get big. They borrowed money to buy land and to buy equipment and put in feedlots and to put in uh, you know confinement facilities and various other things, and they borrowed money to meet the cash flow needs. Then what happened? 1980 had the Russian grain embargo. We decided we didn't like Russia going into Afghanistan, so we put an embargo on it. And it, the Russian deal by itself wasn't a big breaker, but at that same time, we began to lose export markets because we were in a global recession. We had the interest rates had been raised in 81, 82. That was the Reagan administration come in, said we're gonna bring inflation under control. So they put the interest rates up. We had, had inflation rates of about 14, 15%, but they raised interest rates up 16, 17%, even higher than that. Really put a crunch on things, and that led to a global recession. Then they come along in 1985, Farm Bill, a new Farm Bill every five years or so. But they didn't respond by raising prices at that time. They were still committed to this idea of a free market economy. And so what they said then, rather than limit production, or raise the prices, what we'll do is we'll come in with the conservation program. There's a lot of concern about this farming fence row to fence row and, and erosion and things of that nature. So they said, we'll pay farmers to take land out of production rather than raising support prices or putting production controls on. And then that'll be a voluntary sort of thing. It'll be good for the environment and so on. They come up with the conservation reserve program uh, to limit production as opposed to doing it. And when we got into that recession and we saw the export prices drop, we saw the domestic prices drop, and then we saw farmland prices drop for the first time since the Great Recession. And farmland prices went down by, by 25% between 1984 and 1987. It was a real crunch time. That was the farm financial crisis that really began to set in during the mid 80s and so on, after we got into that period of time. We had the farmers that were caught with with huge debts, big debts, bigger than they'd ever had percentage-wise at record high interest rates. There were farmers out here that couldn't even cover the interest rates, let alone pay off the principal on those debts. We had the farm foreclosures, bankruptcies, and even suicides. It was regular fare on the evening news back then. You could turn on CBS, ABC, and NBC almost overnight. 
and you'd see a pro you'd see some spot about the farm problem and you'd see more than once you'd see farmers that committed suicide. That's when I was in Georgia and I was head of the Extension Agricultural Economics Department. <laughs> and at that time, responsibility of people in our department was to go out and try to help these people save their farm. We'd have them bring in their records and we'd go over the records with them and try to figure out some way that they could make it work. Or if they couldn't make it work, we'd try to say, look, you still have some equity. Get out while you still got some equity. Or at least we'd try to talk them out of committing suicide. I said, there's something fundamentally wrong with this. That's not what I was went to school for 20 years to learn how to do, to drive farmers into bankruptcy. And the farmers that were in the biggest trouble were those that had been following what we so-called experts were doing and what the government had been urging them to do. And the farmers that we had labeled as laggards that still had the diversified farm, that had borrowed a lot of money, they weren't thriving, but they weren't going broke. I said, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. Then I began to look beyond what was going on in agriculture, and I looked at rural communities. I could see the rural communities that were suffering economically and socially and decline or decay from the loss of the family farm. Many counties lost 20% of their total population during that period of time of the 1970s up to 1980. Lost 20% of their population overall, not just the farmers. State of Iowa, very agriculturally dependent. The state as a whole in that 10-year period lost 5% of its total population, its farm population. The rest of the country was increasing 10%, but Iowa, the farm state, had lost 5% of its population. There were areas in North Missouri, where I was familiar with at that time and worked later, lost more a third of the total population in towns that totally closed down. Too few farm families left out here to support the farms, the other farm occupations out there. Many rural communities lost their, lost their local banks. The main street businesses closed down. They didn't have enough people. It takes people, not production, to support rural communities. No families. We couldn't keep the uh, doctors within the place. The schools were closing down. There wasn't anybody to keep the churches open. And you didn't have people to serve on the volunteer fire departments, to serve in the city council, or anywhere else. The, the towns were suffering and being crushed. And the sub Surviving small farmers were out there, they bypassed the rural community and bought their input somewhere else so they could get them cheaper. They were farming for the economic bottom line. Many of the rural towns in many of the areas all across the country, particularly in the Midwest, basically become ghost towns. Like the old mining towns and the logging towns, when the mines petered out or when the forests were gone, they turned into the ghost towns. They were having farming ghost towns all across the country. In the 1990s, we still had the market-oriented policies. The people that were convinced that we had to go to a free market economy and agriculture didn't give up. The 1990 Farm Bill continued to lower support prices. But they said, okay, we'll give farmers an opportunity here. We'll give them greater flexibility rather than getting the government payments from the government for corn or soybeans or cotton or whatever. We'll say, you can plant whatever you want to. We'll decouple the the government payment will decouple it then from the particular commodity. We'll give you some flexibility. You can't plant fruits and vegetables, but you, you flood the vegetables. You know, a lot of people say we don't have enough land to produce food, but you flood the vegetable market and put 10% of the crops of the vegetables. So they said you can't do that. But anyway, they said, okay, we'll give you flexibility. We'll let you plant more, more crops in various other areas. So if you're not making money in one crop, you can shift over and you can make it to somebody else. And then the 1996 Farm Bill, which uh, I'm reading a book on how called the, uh, what is it, the Barons, I guess, of different places, but he, he called the 1996 Farm Bill as the Wall Street Farm Bill. He said, okay, we're, we're just going to discontinue production control. We had record, uh, you know, government payments to farmers during out of that Farm Bill, but it's basically upfront payments. It's kind of a bribe to say to give up the support prices. And basically what they said, We'll discontinue the production controls. You can produce all out of whatever you want. And what it, we call that, they called it the freedom to farm bill. We're going we're gonna to let farmers produce, we're going to let farmers produce total output. The reason they call it Wall Street Bill is because what the agribusiness firms wanted, the big grain corporations, they wanted the farmers to produce as much as they possibly could. And the big meat packers wanted to produce as much 
feed grain as they possibly could, you know, and so we could feed more cattle and feed more chickens, increase volume. That's what it was about. But what it turned out to be is what farmers called the freedom to fail bill. Because anytime they turned the farmers in this country loose, they overproduce and prices come down and they fell like a rock. And that's what ended up with a lot of farmers. And they had to back off on this whole idea then basically I think that was the last gasp for this whole idea of the free market kind of agriculture. But during the 1960s, the freedom to fail, they come back in. But in the 2002 bill, the pressure had built up again to come back in and support farm prices. What they did, they, they did both things when they come in in 2002. They said, basically, you can produce all you want to, and if the, if the, the prices go down to the point where they're unprofitable for farmers, what we'll do is with the farm program, we'll just make up the deficiency between the cost of production and whatever farm prices. That's basically where we have been ever since, where they call it deficiency payment or paying to reference prices or whatever they're calling it. They're saying, go ahead and produce, because that's what the big agribusiness corporations want to do. Go ahead and produce, because we've got cheap feed grains, we'll have more cattle, and that's what the big corporations are doing the processing, what do you do? And we will ask the taxpayer to make up the difference between wherever market prices go and whatever it takes to keep you in business by earning this farming operation. So the farms could to be con continue to become bigger and fewer, and they'd have the government to back them up if they got into a tight buying situation with a crop failure and markets go sideways or whatever, as we've seen ever since. So the prices are allowed to decline and governments offset the shortfall of deficiency payments by one name or another. I think now they call it the reference price for our union body, where they'll set it and then they'll make up the difference between the reference price and wherever the market prices go. So the farmers were encouraged to increase production for exports, for livestock feed, then also for ethanol and various other things. But during this 1990s, we also, during this period of time when we're going through this workout, we had a big thing going on in the livestock business. The, the, the Department of Justice made a big change in the 1980s as long as they're changing the farm bill. They went to something in terms of forcing the antitrust, which is basically designed to keep the corporations small enough so they will be competitive. Because to be in a competitive market, you have to have a large number of small enough firms so that no individual firm can begin to influence prices or total output. So they have to compete with each other, but they abandoned that basically. And they said, if you have a situation and two firms want to get together, or you basically want to form a monopoly, the only thing that matters is whether they'll raise consumer price or prices to consumers. So if you go to larger operations, even if they're fewer, regardless of how few they are, if they're going to lower prices to consumers, we're not going to be concerned about how big they are. That's basically what they did in the 1980s, and they're continuing to do it. So we said, we don't care if two or three firms control the total output of, that, of the food, the retailing or whatever, as long as they keep it cheap. They didn't realize what they do is they're competing with each other, and they keep it cheap until they get control of the market, and then they raise the prices back up. I mean, they totally forgot what they learned in the first courses of economics, but it's easy to forget, I guess, when you're getting payoffs from the corporations that... <laughs> Or you're trying to get reelected, and you know who's paying to, for the election campaign. So we saw then, then we saw the situation then in agriculture, particularly in livestock. We saw IBP, uh, ConAgra, XL were the major deep factors at that time, and uh, Smithfield, Tyson, Smith, and Cargill kind of dominated the pork market. They allowed these were consolidations that were going on. Tyson still been proud for doing the cutting, dominating poultry, all feeding. Basically, during that time, they followed the chickens. The chickens had started off, you know, basically in a factory operation with contract production of poultry. We saw it going into the big operations, going into the feedlot on cattle. Now we saw contract feeding on hog feeding followed it. That's why we went into the 90s. This whole idea of vertically integrating where they contract back to the, to the grower of the hogs during that period of time. And then it was a processor that was contracting with producers. What you would do in a normal market situation, you always have hog cycles where you overproduce like everything else, but when you get into a surplus production situation, if you got a normal working market, what happens is you've got an increased supply, you reduce demand at the retail level, you reduce the price of pork, and people eat more pork, and you get rid of the surplus, you come back up. So 
But what they did is since they controlled the whole market, we ended up with a surplus of pork because they were building the big and fine animal feeding operations on pork and this sort of thing, increased production. Instead of lowering the price of wholesale, which would allow retail prices to fall down, they just kept it up. They had their hogs under contract. They kept the price up, which forced the price down at the farm level, and they kept it down until they forced the last to produce it out. Hog prices went down in some cases down to nine dollars, but commonly down to about twelve to thirteen dollars a hundred weight. In the late nineties, we had hog prices lower than we had them during the Great Depression. That wasn't the free market thing. That was the big process of squeezing out the last of the independent hog producers. That's not competition, folks. That's when you see somebody totally out of control market situation. The beef packers controlled the markets through competitive supply. They had laws in the books, and the Packers Administration things, the laws that had been passed earlier that prohibited the, the beef packers from owning beef cattle. But what they did, they had something called captive supplies, where they would make arrangements with the big feedlots and they'd have those cattle tied up to go to a particular pack or wait ahead of the time when the cattle were ready to go in the market. So you didn't have competitive markets. And the vertical integration, as it talks about here, allowed the corporation to the force that even, even independent producers who were far more efficient economically than their contract growers, they could force out of the business by forcing down the price, leaving it down for those producers to stop, and then allowing the prices to come back up so that they were back to the population. A lot of people say, okay, they just got the market because they're more efficient. They were more efficient than hardened the producers, but they forced producers out that were more efficient economically than they were. So rural communities in the 1990s were having to cope with all this. Concentrated animal feeding operations. What do you mean when you talk about concentrated animal feeding operations? What are you concentrating? You're concentrating the animals, or you're concentrating the profits, you're concentrating the waste all among a few people, all in specific places. And there's big consequences for that. The communities end up with the polluted air and water. Everything that, everything that we call pollution is already there before it's pollution. It becomes pollution when you concentrate so much of it in one place that humans can't tolerate or nature can't simulate it or whatever. And that's what we're doing when we put all of these animals in one place. Concentrating too many animals, it's not humane for the animals that are there, but you've got more waste in it and nature can assimilate. You've got more waste and you can effectively utilize this as, as fertilizer. And so it just overloads the air, it overloads the water, it destroys the people, the health of people when you get too much of this stuff in the air, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, other things, you end up with respiratory problems and so on. That's what the aerial communities do. The other communities that didn't have the CAFOs, they said, well, we're concentrating, we get more economic activity where we got the CAFOs and the processing plants. What you're doing, you're not creating jobs, you're not creating economic, you're, you're taking it away from other communities. The other communities are losing their economic base. They may not be as polluted, but they're losing their economic base and they're losing their family farm. And you're concentrating what few jobs are left just in a few communities. And whenever you move the animals into these large operations, you make the grain farms become larger than they were before in the diversified farm because it was, it was the animals on those farms where you could feed the feed to the animals like we did to the hogs that increased the value of the feed and cause the farm to be profitable because you have a diversity of livestock and crops. When you don't have the livestock, you've got to have more crops. You've got to have thousands rather than hundreds of acres of crops to make it work because you've separated the livestock from the crops in those operations. Small independent farms have been forced for a long time to rely more on off-farm income. But in the 1990s, then it become more prominent. During that period of time, it was generally the period of time if you look at farm income, farm family income overall, you'd find that the 75 80 percent of the farm family income came from something other than farming. Most of the farmers that were left that were the smaller farmers weren't making any money at all on the farm, and the rest of them had to have off-farm jobs, not just for insurance and health care, but to make a living. That's when you begin to see organic farming, local food systems, people trying to find ways to make a living on the farm because there was no way to compete with the, with the government subsidized industrial farming operation. Then we got into the 2000s, another decade of companies. We saw the Chinese financial situation, which China was a big importer for 
a long time since the land board said but, but it was one of our major ones in the, in the 19, late 1990s. And that, that right up here, and then we saw the, the Middle East wars again. They were ready to try to cut uh, production, uh, cut farm programs in the early 2000s. But then we got involved in Iraq and Iran, and, and I mean, Iraq and Afghanistan, and so we kept the farm prices up. And so at that time, it was becoming an embarrassment, though, because the, the farm payments had been based on who owned the land or who had the, the land that had the crop uh, quotas on it that applied for the government subsidies. At that time, they began to become aware of the fact that a lot of the people getting the biggest subsidies weren't farmers, but they were sports stars or movie stars or somebody that lived in New York City or New Jersey or Los Angeles or somewhere, and they said, you know, this is embarrassing that paying million dollars to people that already got millions and aren't farming at all. And so they said, we got to have a different strategy to deal with this. So what they did is they started shifting it over and subsidizing crop insurance. And then they subsidized crop insurance. And then later on, they expanded to revenue insurance. But we, the taxpayers, picked up about 60% of the total cost of the crop insurance and the revenue insurance that's going out to subsidizing pig farms. And there's no limit on how much they can sell. And then we had ethanol come in earlier. I should have emphasized it more, but come in back in the 1990s. It never really grew a whole lot. But when we got into the 2000s again, we, we want to increase production. Agriculture is a business. It's an industry. It's not about farming anymore. So what we're going to do is we've got a shortage of fossil energy. So we're going to produce ethanol. Ethanol got to the point where it's using 40% of the corn crop and has been consistently going into fuel for a car. And we talk about feeding the world. I just wonder how it looks to other people. And I wonder how, how we live with it, our own conscience. And we talk about feeding the world and we're burning up 40% of our corn crop in our automobiles when that 40% of the land or the land that's going to 40% of our corn crop could feed half the hungry people in the world if we decided that was really a priority. And when we talk about exports, we don't export from this country to the poorest countries in the world. We export to the countries that have the most of the growing classes that want more meat and things of this nature, and we're exporting feed grains to them, and not food grains to the hungriest people of the world. But anyway, that's just a sad story here. And then, but well, we got into a situation again where we were leading up to this financial crisis in general, but that led to an inflation in farm grain prices, along with commodity prices, increasing agricultural prices. We're back, you know, I, saw, I was thinking about this whole presentation, I said, it's it's like we're on a roller coaster. If you think back to where I've gone already, you go up and you go down, you go up and you go down. The big difference is on a roller coaster, you come back from where you started. We're ending up a long way from where we started in here. But back, we're back to a situation where we got rising agricultural prices, we got rising global food prices, we got hunger around the world and so on. But we restored prosperity out here in agriculture. But then we had the crash in the financial markets. And then the roller coaster begins to slide down again. Farmland prices responded upward when it came up during the, the uh, kind of the rising commodity prices. A lot of that was just pure speculation because the concern in the financial markets that invested in farmland instead of that. And then you had the global economic crisis in 2008, 2009, that caused a decrease in agriculture decreased export demand, increased global uncertainty, and so on. And then we saw the impact of all of this again coming back to the impact on rural America. In rural America in the 2000s, we saw the corporate domination of agriculture and the corporations extracted wealth from rural communities. We saw during that period of time, as you went more of the capos, more of the, the production in large operations, it depended more on and immigration, immigrant, migrant labor to come in from foreign workers, particularly in the capos and horticulture crops. And basically, that's what kind of stabilized to some extent the population in rural communities. It was no longer, you know, the people were still leaving rural areas that had grown up in those areas and been on traditional family farms, and they were being replaced by, by guest workers and short term workers and so on. I'm not opposed to, I've, I've often said that the thing positive thing about industrial agriculture is increasing the cultural diversity of rural areas by those that choose to stay around. But people like that are, are, don't come to be permanent members of the community. They come to work a while and most of them go back home and they send their money back home. I'm just saying that that's not positive for rural communities. It may help keep rural economies alive, but that's all the point I'm making here. 
Then we had the financial crisis, and I said they brought prices down, but it hit rural areas, particularly in the Midwest, harder than it did in other areas. And that's when I think you really begin to see the rural urban divide as rural people said, boy, we're just getting hit with one thing after another, after another, after another. And so somebody, you know, is, is out to get us. Something is going on here because it's with the crisis. The financial crisis, as I said, depressed rural employment, depressed income more than urban employment, and so on. There was it's really, you know, kind of a negative impression set out here. And the negative impacts were greater in the Midwest. But you still had, and this kind of surprised me when I saw that, you still had the median income still higher and the poverty rates were still lower during the early 2000s than they were in the urban areas out here because you, you really had a depression going on in the urban areas, particularly in the inner cities. But the agribusiness in the 2010s, the agribusiness continued to take control. Corporations just continued to get a firmer grip on agriculture. As a, a rule of thumb among economists, there are different measures that people use. But, uh, one of them is that the four corporations control, control more than 40% of the market then it's no longer considered to be a head. It's just kind of a rule of thumb that says, if you let it go below that, you're pretty sure that you don't have competition anymore. One way or the other, they're going to collude, they can raise prices, they can raise profits, they can push the buying prices down like they're buying from farmers. They don't have to really compete. They can collude to keep the prices low and so on. So in 2010, then, these are the industries that had more than and 40% controlled by four firms. That is beef packing, pork packing, broiler, turkey production, soybean crush, good milk sales, corn chips, corn seeds, biotechnology, uh, vegetable seeds, flour milling, grain trading, pesticides, food production, right across the board. You see the, the extent of what you have four or less large corporations that basically are dictating and dominating what goes on in this state. Percentage of agricultural production, you had more and more of it coming under contract. In 2020, the percent of agriculture under contract control <laughs> reported by USDA about a third of the total volume of our value of output of agriculture. But but the contract in, in poultry was over 90% of poultry was under contract, over 75% of the hog, 50% of the cattle were under contract. And even in the case of grain producers that weren't under tight contracts, you had to produce, you know, specific kind of varieties and specific qualities and things like that to meet the standards of the industry. So even that that was under tight contract wasn't under was under corporate control. There were really no competitive markets left for independent producers at that time. You can hear people talk about at one time they had three or four different elevators they could take their grain to. You know, if there's a big line at one, you could go to another, or you could check prices down another, down to one or maybe two. Then they have to go a long way because there's no meat packers. You hear people talk about, you know, having to haul hogs hundreds of miles to find one meat packer, let alone you have four or five that you can feed for. So, what you had with all the consolidation, there really wasn't a competitive market left. And you go on now, you can see prices reported in. It, it, now they report two different prices. It's the ones that go to people that have the arrangements for the process. It's the one that's kind of the free market price. The free market price is always a big discount mm -hmm. because they just buy from the independent producers to fill in somewhere and they don't buy a competitive price. So the smaller forces, the producers are forced to produce for organic markets or local niche markets or various other places or increasingly rely on non farm income. The corporate consolidation, and my friend, actually, I was on the graduate committee down at the University of Missouri, Mary Hendrickson, where Bill Heffernan was before, and they do these updates now and then. And this is where GBS, which is Brazilian firm, and then this perfect was bought out national beef. That's also a Brazilian firm, and Tyson and Cardio have control 73% of the beef industry in 2021. JBS, which bought out Swift and a bunch of other brands, and Cargill WH Group, which is a Chinese group that bought out Smithfield, 67% of pork. Again, there's JBS and there's Tyson, Purdue, Sanderson, 54% uh, of chicken processing, General Mills, Kellogg, Coles, 83% of the cold cereal, Walmart, Kroger, Alderson, Costco, 45% of all the groceries, McDonald's, Young Brands, which has Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, Wendy and Subway, 39% fast foods. It goes on and on and on. And the farms grow larger and the farms grow fewer. If you look at the USDA farm system, 207 to 217, the number of farms count 
three percent, but the loss is in the mid-size. Again, you have a few more large, smaller firms, more of the larger firms. The largest four percent of the farms now control set fifty-eight percent of the total farmland in the country. The largest five percent of the farms, seventy-five percent of the total production. The largest ten percent farms get eighty percent of all the government payments. The largest twelve percent get ninety-six percent of all of the net farm income. Profits from farming, farming income for those who have some other occupation, less than ten percent of the family income. For those that forty percent of the farmers who have primary occupation other than farming, farming is the sideline. And when the farm income is less than twenty-five percent for those families that can consider farming to be their primary occupation. Basically, we got eighty. 90% of the farmers out here are, are farming because they, they just want to farm. Even though they're contributing very little to the family income, the farm is contributing very little. It's just that they want to be farmed. I think, you know, if we had changes in government policy, you know, we gave those farmers half a chance to make a living farming. You'd have a lot of those farmers that would change the way they're farming. But we're in a situation now where what we've done to our rural communities, I think just sums it up some of the best. I don't know how many of you ever heard of, of Wendell Berry. He's a writer, you know, novel writer, but he also writes a lot of uh, you know, rural culture kind of stuff and poetry and things of that nature. But he was responding to a, a article that's in the New York Times. Uh, I guess it was in the magazine section or something like this. I put up here at the top between 10 2010, 2020, for the first time, rural areas lost population, total population overall. It's really big in the farming state. But the very bright in response to that article that's kind of criticizing the, the, the rural communities for the rural urban divide and so on. He says the business of America has been largely without apology the plunder of rural America, for which everything of value, the minerals, the farms, the timber, the farm animals, farm crops, and labor has been systematically taken at the lowest possible price. As apparently none of the enlightened ones have seen in flying over or bypassing on the interstate highways, it's too large fields, toxic and eroded, it's fields and rivers poisoned, it's forest mangled, it's towns dying and dead along with the locally owned small businesses, it's children leaving at the high school and not coming back. Too many children are not working at anything, too many are transfixed on various screens. Too many on drugs and too many are dying. That was the vision that we left with the rural communities after decades of pollution and extraction, exploitation, for the sake of profits for large agribusiness corporations, aided by government, but not government just doing it. Government just simply didn't stop it. There was a Wall Street Journal article that called Rural America the New Inner Cities. It started off, it said, starting in the 1980s, the nation's basic castes were in urban areas where the toxic fuel of crime, drugs, and suburban fights conspired to make large cities the so strong in most troubled places. Today, however, a Wall Street Journal analysis shows that many of the measures of socioeconomic well being, the charts have flipped in terms of poverty, college attainment, teenage birth, divorce rates, death rates, and heart disease, and cancer reliance on. Federal disability insurance and male labor force participation. Rural counties now rank the worst among the four major population groups, lower than in the state. That's the legacy of four decades, five decades, what we've seen in terms of what's happened to rural communities. <clears throat> this is a, a kind of a summary of what I see as the consequences of the, the farm, past farm policy. The advantage that has been taken of those policies by large agribusiness corporations. It was put together by a panel of experts, international experts on sustainability to focus on food in a 2016 report. They said that today's food and farming systems have succeeded in supplying large volumes of food to global markets. That's what the policies were designed to do. But it says that generating negative outcomes on multiple Widespread degradation of land, water, and ecosystems, high greenhouse gas emissions, diversity losses, persistent hunger, micronutrient deficiencies alongside the rapid rise in obesity and 
diet related diseases and livelihood stresses for farmers all around the world. We're not talking about just here, but as we spread that industrial model all around the world. But they went on to say that there's alternatives. And I would emphasize that there's alternatives there, like there was 50 years ago, to make fundamental changes in that. We can choose a better future. And what they said, what is required is a fundamentally different model of agriculture based on diversifying farms and farm landscapes, placing chemical input, optimizing biodiversity, and stimulating interaction between different species as part of a holistic strategy to build long term soil fertility, health, and agro ecosystem, and secure livelihood farming. The data show that these systems can compete with industrial agriculture in terms of total output, performing particularly strongly under environmental stress and delivering production increases in places where additional food is desperately needed. Diversified agroecological systems can also pave the way for diverse types of input. The systems are out there. They want them to say it. it's not a lack of research. It's not a lack of what we need. It's a lack of, of policies that would support this kind of transition. It's a change in policy from supporting the industrial model, which has been tremendously successful in producing increased production at lower cost levels, but has been a total failure in terms of the impact on the environment and on rural communities and on society in general. They say what's needed is a change in policy, but they say it's going to be difficult because of the political power of the large agribusiness corporations and others that are benefiting from the system. So what about the next 50 years of farming in rural communities? I like this observation from Margaret Wheatley. I don't know if many of you have heard of her, but she's a respected writer, kind of a futurist, and is a consultant to some of the farms and some of the big operations. And recently, she was speaking at what's called a big learning event at the University of Wisconsin, and she prepared a paper ahead of that. She's been Away from a while, she said she'd been kind of thinking about what was going on. Three, three things that she said that, that she observed in the system. Then I think this was like 2017, 2018, somewhere along in there. And she said there's a, a growing sense of impotence and dread about the nation. This is what I see in, in rural communities. This is what I see in a lot of other places. I agree with this. There's a, this sense that things aren't right. You know that there's something fundamentally wrong out here. And they say that she come up with a realization that information doesn't change minds. Anymore. We don't know what's true and what isn't true. We don't know what's good science and what isn't. We've got alternative facts and things like that to deal with. We don't know what to believe in, which is a very confusing kind of situation. You know, there's lots of people, and maybe many in this room, that listen to me and say, that's just a bunch of BS. I got to know what he's talking about. You know, I can't prove that I can. I can't prove that I do. So we don't know what to believe. And then she said that they said the, the, the thing that she came up with is the clarity that the world changes through local communities taking action. That there's no power for change greater than communities taking the future into its own hands. And I agree with that. I, I don't think that we're going to change the situation in terms of farm policy by the political leaders that are in Washington, D.C. We know that the, the business leaders are not going to change, are not going to change that much. Politicians basically follow, they don't lead. They 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 say they listen to the people. I didn't tell you that. They say we listen to the people and, and see what the people tell us to do, or what the people force us to do or force us not to do. It's up to us. It's not, they're not going to do it. It's up to us to decide what kind of future we want and say, we want the policies that will bring about that future. My sort of mentor was, mentor was a fellow by the name of Harold Brimer. He spent his whole life on agricultural policy, working at USDA, retired from the University of Missouri. And he continued, like I have, until he was 86. I haven't kept up with him yet, but Harold used to say, he said, we can have any kind of agriculture in this country if we want. All we have to do is get the policies, bring it about. And the last 60 years proves that that's possible. The agriculture we have today, I was talking to someone earlier, they said, well, gee, if we go out here and support organic small farm sustainable agriculture, that's government planning. That's government deciding what kind of agriculture. I said, government decided what kind of agriculture we want. 
government decided that we wanted this kind of agriculture, and that's what we got. And if we decide we want something different, we can get something different. And she goes on to say that global change always begins with small local efforts and then connects with other small local efforts. And after many years of hard work and experimenting and learning together, these small efforts may suddenly emerge as a powerful global system of change. That's what happened in the 60s. They were agricultural economists, business leaders, and other people that worked for decades for that report in the 1960s. They had been working to that point and they grasped the opportunity and they moved. We have an opportunity to do it in a different way today. As I look back and through that period of time that I lived through it, and much of it, I was in college or I had a PhD and I was already a, a, a documented licensed agricultural economist. As I look back, we know more about the alternatives to industrial agriculture today than we knew about industrial agriculture 50 years ago. We went into that experiment of transferring industrial agriculture to industrial agriculture with very little knowledge of where the technologies would take us, of where the corporations would take us, of what the eventual consequences were going to be. I've been working for the last 40 years with people, you know, 40 years with people that are creating an alternative. They may be called organic or more recently the real organic or regenerative or resourceful, resilient or permaculture or agroecology or nature farming. Or there's a whole host of people out here that are working on these alternatives. And they're making them work. They're working with local food systems and food hubs and local food stops and a whole range of things out here. These people are creating the alternatives and they know more about how to replace industrial agriculture than we knew about industrial agriculture when they changed policy before. But I believe the change must come in local communities where people care about each other and are committed to taking care of the, the niches within nature and the places that they live. It's a matter of saying that there is more to life than economics, and everything doesn't eventually boil down to just how much money did you make. That how you treat your neighbor is important. That your relationships are important. That having a sense of purpose in life is important. That, that feeling good about what you do and how you farm or how you work or what you say, that's important. I can tell you as an economist, the economy was never meant to be the objective of society with the increased economic growth or increased economic wealth. The economy is meant to be a, a means of allowing us to do what we decide that we ought to do with our lives, in our relationships with each other, and in our relationship with the earth. It's a means to an end. It's not the end. There's been studies all over, I call them the happiness studies, that point out that but sure, economic well-being is important up to a point globally up to about ten or fifteen thousand dollars per person to take more than that in this country. But beyond that point, whether you're happy or unhappy, or whether you're sad or you're satisfied or whatever, depends upon the quality of your relationship with other people, within families, within communities, whether you have friendship. We have an epidemic of loneliness in this country that's destroying our health because we become separated, buying and selling everything other than relating to other people. But it's that relationships that is part of our happiness. And beyond that, it's our sense of purpose, the sense that what we're doing is very good. That's what I'm talking about in communities where people know and care about each other and feel a sense of responsibility to take care of the earth for the benefit of the future. There's no economic value in doing anything for ensure that we have farms here 50 years, 100 years in the future. There's no there's no economic benefit in what I'm doing in terms of trying to save the rural communities out in the future. I, I won't live to get any economic return if I was interested in getting it. There's no social reason. I won't know anybody. I won't be here. The only reason I'm doing what I'm doing, the only reason most farmers are still out here farming because they're not making any money is they feel that's the purpose that they were given here to be caretakers of the earth, to pass it on to the next generation. It's good or better than it was passed to them. It doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make social sense, but it makes common sense because it gives them purpose and meaning. I didn't understand those farmers that were committing suicide until I understood that they were a part of that farm. That farm was a part of them. And when they lost that farm, they lost a part of themselves. That's what it's about. 
It's about knowing those priorities. And I think that's where we are. The change must begin among people that care about it. People are always asking me and say, well, are you optimistic? We're going to get that change? Are you just an idealistic fool? Well, maybe I am. But I have hope. Vaclav Havel, the chef reformer and philosopher, he said, hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. He says, it's hope above all that gives us the strength to live and continually try new things, even conditions that others seem hopeless. The speaker of the Eagles. I have hope. And then he ended up by saying, life is simply too precious a thing to permit its devaluation, living pointlessly, emptily, without meaning, without love, and without hope. I have hope. The change we need may not be easy and quick. It may be difficult. It may be like Teddy Roosevelt said, you know, it's the, the important thing he said is to, to be in the arena. Even if you fail while daring greatly, to be in the arena, that's what we're talking about. It may not be easy, it may not be quick, but what we're talking about here makes sense, it gives purpose and meaning. I know that what I've talked about here tonight, I know in my heart, my truth, that is possible. And in that, there is hope. Thank you for your time. That's my truth. Now, what about yours? Okay? Thank you. Well, I, I think both parties have been supporting in general the policies that have come up. If I, if I had to kind of summarize what we have between the two political parties, it, it's a tendency when you have the, the Democrats in charge, they will want to put more money into the uh, food assistance programs, which are also in the Department of Agriculture. They'll want to put more money into the conservation environmental programs. Uh, but they're not going to threaten the commodity programs very much at all. They're not going to threaten industrial agriculture in doing that. They're going to put a little more money, like the Democratic administration, putting more money into local foods, a little more in organic farming. If you have the Republican administrations coming in, they're going to cut back on the food assistance programs, and they're going to cut back on the environmental programs, and they're going to increase payments on the commodities. But you're, you're not going to have fundamental change in agriculture by changing the party that's in the that's in USDA, because we've seen what I've talked about going from the 1960s all the way through. You've seen Democratic re re administrations, Republican administrations. You haven't seen a major change in policies during that period of time. You may have seen the Republican administrations move more vigorously toward free market sort of concepts, but you haven't seen the Democratic administrations back That's away. right, and they, vo they, they voted him out and shut him down real quick. Did you have a question on that? Congress shut him down. Yes. Okay, who's who's next here? I'm getting something on here. Okay, another question, comment? I think that's a, that's a question you need to ask. Uh, you know what what's your purpose? When I when I ask uh, when people ask me what they can do is, I say again my truth, my belief. You talk about New Testament, whatever. I believe we're here for a purpose. 
And I, I think there's there's something that we can sense. It's a spiritual thing, but we sense that what we ought to do. And a lot of times we're led into doing things that we that we don't feel good about doing. I talked to a lot of a lot of farmers, he'd say a lot of farmers, but I, I think it represents a lot of farmers that are into corn soybeans and, and capos and things like that, that they aren't comfortable with. It. That wasn't what they wanted to do, and they don't feel good about it. But they say, okay, I've got all this money, I've got it tied up in land, I've got it in equipment, I borrowed money to put in this big building for these hog operations or these chickens, I borrowed millions of dollars or whatever it is, and it's going to take 15, 20 years to pay it out. I was led into this, I was told this was the future of hog production, this is the future of chicken, this is the only way to stay in farming. And now I'm into this, For now I've got these crops here and I've got the payments coming in. I, I don't I don't see any way out. I don't see any way I can continue to farm other than what I'm doing here, but they don't feel good about it. And I would say is, you know, I'm going on my 85th birthday and and you can see I made a big change in the middle of live life that really changed my career trajectory. I was a department head. I was hoping one day to be a agricultural uh, program leader or maybe a dean. That wasn't gonna happen when I started questioning the system. But I said, whatever time I've got left, I want to live a life that I can feel good about, even if I sacrifice money, even if I sacrifice prestige, even if I got a lot of people out here that don't want to hear what I have to say and hate me. I want to feel good about myself. And so I changed, but you have to decide for yourself if you feel comfortable about what you're doing, think it's right, keep on doing it, I guess. And if you don't, why well, find some way to change? All right. Well, what I, what I think, where I've come back on this is saying, I've concluded that the closer we live toward what nature would have us to do in a place, then the better off we're gonna be in the long run. So I think we ought to say, okay, how many livestock can we produce in a way that we feel good, good about the way we're treating our animals, the way we're treating our land, uh, that we're producing good food that's healthy for people. And then we ought to adjust our diets to whatever level of livestock or whatever level of meat we can produce that way. And if that means we're producing half as much as we are now, then we need to be willing to adjust our level of consumption to what's healthy for us and healthy for the land and what's good for the animals and what's good for the future generation. So I can't tell you how much more or less that would be. I know there's a big move right now of saying, okay, we've got to, we've got to uh, produce fewer livestock for global climate change and things of that nature, but a lot of those problems are associated with the way we produce livestock rather than just the livestock. So if we got back onto grass and places like this, then it would be more expensive. The beef would be more expensive now than finishing out on the grain. But if you had a change in farm policy so that we weren't subsidizing the grain and we were making sure that the grain was produced in a way that didn't pollute the water and, and was producing healthy food, then we might find that situation was different as well. So I think again, Part of it's an individual choice. People that want to be vegan and vegetarian, to me, that's a moral decision, and that's fine with me if they shouldn't eat it. And there's other people, maybe for health reasons, they think you should eat less beef or whatever. Uh, those are different considerations, but from a sustainability standpoint, I think we need to start looking as to what nature would support us here in a healthy way and then adjust our diet to what nature would give us or allow us to produce. other people in the chat can also hear. As you are saying, where if there was no government funding, where would the money be? Yeah. I mean, like, where's the paper in the country? Yeah. People know that, you know, it's possible to do it, but where could it work through? Yeah. Well, I think you, you saw some of the things I was talking about here. I was talking about yields that are comparable to uh, that you could get. It would take a lot more farmers to produce at that level, and you'd have to go through a transition period. Whether you, I, I think on corn, for example, you wouldn't be 
are getting three or 400 bushel per acre, but you can get 200 bushel per acre or more than that in a farming operation, even if it's an organic operation. Once you build up the soil fertility in the level and you've got the corn in rotation with other crops that you've got money. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so if, if you're, but, but the average corn yield in Iowa this year is 200 bushel. That's the average for the state. So uh, it's possible out here, that sort of thing. But I think the, the important thing a lot of people get at to understand that at what you pay at the grocery store, less than 50% of that is what, uh, 15% is what the farmer gets. So, so when you're talking about uh, kind of agriculture that would increase farm level costs, a lot of people are saying, well, you're gonna to have to pay more at the grocery store. Well, you, you might during the early transition until you made the transition over to something else. But, but if it's only 15% on average uh, that the, you're paying the farmer, let, let's say even if farm level cost went up 50% and farm prices, prices of farm commodities went up 50%, 50 percent of that 15 percent is seven and a half percent, right? So you tack that seven and a half percent. If the rest of the grocery prices didn't go up, you've only increased grocery prices by seven and a half percent, and you 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 paid the farmer 50 percent more than they were getting before, but the grocery price has only gone up seven and a half percent. They went up more than that in one year during the pandemic, certainly two years during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're getting 50% more as a farmer. You don't need the subsidies. Yeah, but I'm saying the person in town is paying 7.5% more. So if you, the studies that have been done indicate the best estimates that we could make a transition to what I've talked about, agroecology, sustainability, this sort of thing, not necessarily just organic, but going back Let's say with farm sizes similar to what we had in the 1950s and 60s, not to just small pots and all that kind of stuff. And then taking the animals out of confinement and putting them back on pasture or putting them in sheds where they've got access to outdoor things, you know, of that nature that's more humane, it's more environmentally sound. Having diversified farm operations where you get the manure back to the fields where the crops are produced and things of that nature. But you'd be looking at food prices somewhere between 8 and 12 percent higher. You'd be producing healthier foods. You'd have stronger rural communities. You wouldn't be polluting the water with, with uh, or the air with uh, odors or water with uh, chemicals or water with nitrates and things of that nature. I think if you, you went to the consumers and they actually believed you and you said, okay, if you pay 10% more for your groceries, you can have healthy food, you can take care of the water, you won't have pollution, you can have good, good welfare for the animals, and that's that's all it's going to cost you, and then the farmer is going to get 50, 60 percent more for what they're doing because it's costing them something more for the way that they're growing. I think if that choice was laid out to the consumers, you'd find that most consumers would say, "Fine, let's have it," because food prices, food, like I say, food prices have gone up. You you talk about it here, the food prices have gone up 10 or 12 percent in the last three or four years, and I, I don't see a lot of people starving to death. So. Complain a lot, but start to death. Because the problem is we didn't get anything out of it. We're just paying more for the same stuff. Or maybe, maybe it's not even as good as stuff, but we paid 10% more and we actually got something out of it in terms of healthy food. We'd have twice as many farms. We'd have stronger rural communities. We'd begin to rural, you know, re rebuild rural America. If you can do that for the price of 10% of food, why not? Good deal, right? goes through. <laughs> well, uh, right now when you're moving this through the system, it's, it's economically efficient to move it through the system that it's going right now. Now, if you go back, what I've talked about, I started going back to the local level. Now, it's very efficient at doing what the food system does, which is packaging, transportation, advertising, things of that nature. 
Now, if you go back to more local and regional kind of food systems, then you can cut out a lot of the transportation. If you get more directly from farmers, you can cut out the packaging. If you buy raw, more raw or minimally processed food and prepare it yourself or somebody prepares it within the local community, you cut out a lot of that processing, that pre-processing that goes on in pre-preparing food. So there's a lot of things that you're paying for with that 85% that you can cut out. The point I'm making is if you want to get all of the convenience, I, th I think 85% basically we spend on convenience to make it more convenient for us to get food to eat or to get, get somebody to convince us that we ought to want convenience rather than do it ourselves. But, it, but if, if you want all of that stuff, then you probably can't do it much more efficiently than the industry's doing it. But you have opportunities not to do all that stuff if you more go to a more localized food system and you go to less processing, less packaging, less advertising, less of these other things. And if you did that, if you cut out a bunch of that stuff, you might end up with food that's actually cheaper at the retail level uh, than it is now with a farming system that's much more sustainable than it is now. So it, what I'm talking about is, is the change is possible, but you're, you, you can't make that transition as long as the, the government is not enforcing environmental regulations on the big farms. I'm not talking about all the farms. There's something called uh, uh, agricultural exceptionalism in terms of farm policy. Now, agricultural exceptionalism means that they made the case early on, which I think is a is a, a wise case. I think it's true that the, that the traditional independent family farmer doesn't really need to be regulated with respect to pollution and things of this nature because they're not concentrating stuff in one place. They're not creating an environmental risk to be mitigated through government policies. It's it's kind of like if you're if you live out in the country. By yourself, you can put in a septic tank and you're not polluting anything. If you got two or three houses, you can have a lagoon or whatever it is. So you don't need all of that. But if you've got a city, then you need regulations. Then you need a waste treatment city. And if you've got a CAFO, a hog CAFO is 2,400 head, you've got a town of eight to 10,000 people. And you don't just spread the manure from a town of eight to 10,000 people in people's backyards and around the city. So anyway. So if you regulated agriculture, big agriculture, like it should be regulated so that they couldn't just dump their waste on other people. And if you treated animals humanely like farmers traditionally did by giving them space to move around in and all that kind of, that kind of thing too, you know, then uh, what you're doing then is if you were removing a lot of the advantage for the big industrial operations and you'd make it you know, more economically feasible for the farmers to farm some different ways. But you need to change government policies. What I've advocated is take that government subsidized crop insurance we got and, and let's, why don't we ensure the, the net revenue or income of family farmers that will farm in a, in a socially and environmentally responsible way. So if you put together a farm plan that you implement over five or 10 years and move toward that, then we'll ensure that you don't make any less income as a farm family than the non-farm families make in your community or your area. And if you make more than that, then that's fine. But we're gonna do the same thing for you that we're doing now for the crop producers when we ensure that they won't lose money. We're gonna ensure for you as a family, if you're willing to produce in a way that really produces good food, that takes care of the environment, that's good for communities, then we'll ensure that your family income doesn't drop below that. We're not gonna pay you any more than that. You're not gonna get thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but you can make the transition and the farming is what you want to do with your life and your family. We're going to make sure that you can do it if you do it in a socially and ecologically responsible way. I think if you had that kind of a policy in place, you would have a transition. You wouldn't see food prices go up. You'd see rural communities thrive. You'd take care of the environment. You'd clean up the water. You'd clean up the air. Rural communities would be places where everybody would want to live. You'd have a lot of farmers and you'd have a lot of other people that really appreciate the quality of life rather than just making money. Well, we have five more minutes till nine o'clock. So one more question. Fine. Um, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think I think there needs to be a change. I was in the land grant university system back when the change happened, and when we used to support individual family farms, out on families and farms, balanced farming program, balanced way of life, conservation, that sort of thing. We made the transition to start importing, you know, just import industrial agriculture for economic efficiency. I think what, in terms of technology development, like here, what little I know about the grand farm out here is that if if the private industry wants to do that and we're not regulating private industry, let private industry do it. But I think we need to shift over the public institutions, the public research and education needs to focus on technologies that would work in the sustainable farming operations. And the kind of technologies I'm talking about is technologies that take the drudgery out of farming, that do, take the drudgery task and the technology does that, but leaves the thinking to the farmer. Because I think if you're going to farm in a sustainable way, the farmer has to know their particular farm and their family and their community. And they have to be able to farm in a way that's unique to that operation. And it's as much about inspiration, it's as much about feeling as it is about the technical aspect of when you're going to spray or what you're going to spray or whether you're going to spray and things of that nature and when you're going to close and that sort of thing. So when the farmer decides what they're going to do management-wise, then rather than just having to spend hours and hours doing the same repetitive tax, like when we used to put up hay, you know, and you had to pitch hay bales, round hay bales, you had to have a loving relationship with that hay bale and get it up close to you and try to poke it up on the wagon. And you did that day after day after day or whatever. That was drudgery and the kind of technology that takes that drudgery out. So we focused on those kinds of technologies. And I've got a I've got a friend that I've worked with that was in a class at, uh, at the university where I was, and, and she's out in the West Coast now, and she's working with a, a small technology firm, and they're working on a, a robotic kind of, I guess you'd call it kind of a tractor that works on a robotic scale, but they're talking about ten to twelve thousand dollars for this robotic instrument that will do all kinds of things, different different kinds of things on the smaller farming operations and on organic farming operations. They're talking about one now that will spread beneficial insects across the field. And they're talking about harvesting things, you know, like you're harvesting crops where you have to stoop down and this sort of thing. So it would do a lot of the stoop stuff. But but I'm thought I'm thinking uh, Wes, you were you were talking earlier about the what, what was your saying you had that you wanted technology that would let you do the painting and singing and Oh, yeah, um, we were talking about how uh, there's a tweet I saw that said, I really would like uh, AI to be the, to do my laundry and my uh, and my uh, gardening so I can paint pictures and write songs and not the other way around, have them write songs and paint pictures so that I can do my laundry. So, <laughs> so what I'm talking yeah. about is rather than the, the technology that they're working on today that wants to replace the farmer in doing the thinking about what needs to be done and how it's to be done and this sort of thing, is let the farmer decide what's to be done and when it needs to be done and the technology does the, does the hard work. So it, you could have a high, highly technical age uh, agriculture that employed a lot of sophisticated technology if you had the technology developers in the public sector, that wouldn't necessarily be the most profitable technology. Focus on developing that kind of technology and then let, let the private sector develop whatever technology. It's gonna develop technology that makes profits for the corporation. That's what, that's what a corporation is and that's what it does. This talk about private-public partnerships basically is a way by which the corporations leverage, uh, you know, public get public money to do the things that they want to do. They they get the public sector to do the real thinking work that requires professors and people like that and experiment, much costly kind of work, and then they they patent it and put it into practice. And they make the money from it. We need to turn that around. And focus our public research and education on things that sub the public good that the private sector won't do because it's not profitable, but it's still good for farmers and still good for rural communities and still good for society. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And social life. That's right. If we if we changed, if we could bring about the public pressure to change public policy to create a different kind of agriculture, I'm convinced that we have the technology have the know-how, we have the knowledge of the alternative systems 
that within a matter of two or three decades, a fundamental change in, in agriculture and in family farms that would be positive in many ways for rural communities. We can rebuild the farm and food system if we have the courage to do it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to visit with you tonight. And don't give up hope, okay?